Hi, this is Matt Baker. Since today is the last day of the year, I thought it would be a good day to take a look at some more fan-made charts, ones that were submitted during 2021. I did something similar about a year ago when the channel reached 500k subscribers. Since then, we've started a Useful Charts subreddit as a place for fans to post their creations, and I'm happy to say that we've received a lot. So today I'm going to show you some of those charts and react to them as we go. Now, like I say, the subreddit has been quite busy. So unfortunately, I can't show you everything. So here's what I'm going to do. First of all, I'm going to show you the top 10 charts according to the amount of upvotes they received. Then I'm going to show you an additional 10 charts, ones that I personally selected because they stood out to me for one reason or another. So let's begin. I'll start by clicking the top button and then switching it from today to this year. And doing this reveals that the top post of 2021 was this chart called Western Composers Genealogies. So let's zoom into this chart. And I gotta say, just from the sheer size of this chart, this thing is amazing. I can't imagine the amount of time and energy that went into creating this. Let's start by taking a look at the legend here in the top right corner. So the first thing I figured out about this chart is this is not actually a family tree chart. This is a teacher pupil chart. So this is showing how various composers are related uh, kind of into various schools and whatnot. So if there's a solid line, it means that the one composer taught the other composer. And I guess if there's a dotted line, it means there's some kind of uncertainty about the influence. And then you can see it is color coded by nationality. So let's go over here to someone that I know. Let's let's go to J.S. Bach, one of the more famous composers. And I can see here, you know, he's got lots of students, uh, several of which share his last name. So I, I think actually he had several children that were also composers. And I believe that star means um, some of the more famous people have the star. But let's look at his influences. So He's got two teachers here, one of which J.C. Bach. I assume that was his dad, maybe? Actually, no, the dates don't seem right on that. Maybe an uncle or something? Again, I, I don't know much about music or composers, so th this is why I like these fan-made charts, because fans can go into topics that I'm not familiar with. A lot of people have requested something about music. Um, I, it's just something I don't know a lot about, so this person obviously does. Let's go ahead and trace who had an influence on J.S. Bach. So we can go immediately up to someone named Dietrich, and I have no idea how to pronounce that last name, and then a Johann Thiel, and then a Heinrich Schutz, and then we can keep going. Let's go with the solid connection here to someone named Giovanni. So it looks like we've switched over to some Italian, I assume, composers, and we can go up. To an Andrea Gabrielli. And if I choose the solid line, I can go all the way to an Adrian Willert. And then, wow, it, it, I can go all the way up through solid lines uh, to 1450. And then it gets dotted lines. But if, if we follow that dotted line, wow, we can trace J.S. Bach all the way to, you know, Renaissance era. So... That's pretty cool. So, I mean, this chart has a lot of composers. I noticed at the very bottom, you even get some um, modern people, like uh, here's John Williams. John Williams, of course, did the Star Wars theme and a lot of stuff from movies. So, really well done. Thank you so much to whoever made this chart. Okay, the second most popular post on the subreddit is actually not a chart. It's this meme. And I gotta say, it does deserve to be here because it, it is indeed pretty funny. 
Um, this, of course, is Charles II, the last of the Spanish Habsburgs. We like to joke quite a bit on the channel about the Habsburgs because they are notorious for their inbreeding. So here it says me finding a first cousin marriage in my family tree. So got to admit, that's pretty funny. Okay, so the next chart, though, is this one, and it's about the House of Capet from France. And again, just look at the size of this thing. It's amazing. The House of Capet is one of my favorite royal houses from Europe, simply because it lasted for so long. When I did my video on the top 10 dynasties from Europe, I chose the House of Capet as number one. One of the main reasons for that, if we just look up here to the top corner at the map, not only did the House of Capet rule France for a really long time, but it actually ruled a bunch of other countries. Most notably, of course, it's still ruling in Spain today. But it also ruled in Hungary for quite a while. You can see it ruled a good portion of Italy, even ruled uh, Poland-Lithuania for a while. And um, that green there near Greece, it also ruled one of the Latin Crusader states. So if we zoom out to the chart, I mean, you can see how many branches there were to this dynasty. And let me remind you, we're talking here about male-only lines. So a lot of royal houses, you know, die out after, you know, a couple centuries because the male heirs run out. But the House of Capet is unique in that <laughs> they seem to do really well at producing male heirs. So the royal line in France lasted, you know, way longer than, than most royal houses did in Europe. But the interesting thing about the House of Capet is that it had all these other branches as well, you know, that ruled different countries, different places. This chart is amazing because it, it traces not only the royal line of France, but all the other branches as well. And I got to say, I, I appreciate that at the very bottom here, whoever made this chart put the House of Orlen uh, all the way kind of on the left, showing that, that they are the kind of senior house these days, even though technically from a genealogical perspective, the Spanish Bourbons are actually um, senior. So you can see here in the middle, the King of Spain is there, as well as Louis Alphonse, who's, you know, calls himself the head of the house, because genealogically speaking, he is the most senior person on the tree. But you can also see all the way to the right-hand side, you've got Henri, the current Grand Duke of Luxembourg as well. So, amazing chart. All right, let's go to the next one, which is the Welsh Royal Family's Tree. And again, this one is really large and super cool. And I gotta admit, I referred to this one when I was working on my own Wales chart. Although I must say, I, I did double check everything. But the good thing about this chart is it shows all the various kingdoms within Wales. Wales was never really united as a single kingdom. It, it had all kinds of little small petty kingdoms. And so this chart, I, what I like about this chart is it color codes everything. So that's why it's so colorful. For example, if we go to the middle here to Hyal Da, you know, the reason why I get Jack to pronounce some of these videos is that he's way better at pronunciation. I do admit I suck at pronunciation. I know that. Good at the visual stuff, not the pronunciation stuff. Anyway, this particular Welsh king here, it looks like a rainbow here. Red, yellow, green, blue, because he ruled those four different kingdoms. And so the neat thing about this chart is it shows, you know, when a particular king ruled more than one kingdom, you can easily see which kingdoms that person ruled. So... Uh, very cool layout. If you're into Welsh history, this is a chart you're going to want to look at because it maps it all out. So very cool. I really appreciate the person who did this. And I, I should point out that the person who did this also did one on who would be Prince of Wales today. So he actually, I assume it's a he, I won't mention any names in the video for privacy's sake, but he actually traced it all the way to today. So that's pretty cool. All right, the next one uh, is Henry VI and his six wives relationship. So this is really cool because Henry VIII was actually related to all six of his wives. And this chart shows you how. So one way or another, all six of his wives trace back to Edward I, King of England. And so this shows all the marriages and then you can trace each wife all the way back. So one thing you can see quite clearly is that two of his wives 
Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, those two were the most closely related. You can see from the chart here that they were first cousins. And just looking quickly, it looks like the wife that he was most closely related to was Jane Seymour, because they both descend from Edmund Mortimer III, Earl of March. But keep in mind here, this is not actually a very close relationship. That looks like second, third, fourth, like fourth or fifth cousins, sixth cousins, even something like that. So, but very interesting that uh, this shows all the connections. Okay, next up is something a little bit similar. We have here the royal descendants of John William Frizo, Prince of Orange. So those of you that are fans of royal genealogy probably know that the most recent common ancestor for all the monarchs of Europe is this fellow at the top, John William Frizo. So a lot of the current monarchs of Europe can trace themselves to Queen Victoria. A lot of them can also trace their lines to Christian the Ninth of Denmark, but not everyone traces to um, both those individuals in, in the exact same way. So if you're looking for just one individual who's the common ancestor of everyone, not just the kings and queens, but also, um, for example, the Prince of Monaco and the Grand Duke of Luxembourg and the Prince of Liechtenstein, the most recent common ancestor is this Prince of Orange at the top. So this chart shows how everybody is related. Basically the closest relationship between each person. So that's pretty neat. Next up, we have the ancestors of King Charles II of Spain. So here we go. We saw Charles II earlier. He's famous for his big jutting chin. And this chart just shows how inbred he really was. So you can see that most of his lines, one way or another, go back to the same two people, uh, which is ridiculous, which makes this look more like a circle than a tree. Lots of cousin marriages in here, even some uncle-niece marriages. But I, I would like to point out, though, that not every single ancestor is shown on this chart. So it's not as if he only has two ancestors going back that far. You can see that a couple ancestors have been left off. For example, Ferdinand I's wife isn't shown, uh, so that would give us some more ancestors there. And then over on the far right, Christina of Denmark also would have had a father, uh, and he's not shown on the chart. So there would have been a, you know, a little bit more in terms of genealogical ancestry there, a little bit more extra DNA that, that wasn't Habsburg DNA. But, um, you know, overall, this guy was super, super inbred, and that's why he had such poor health. So... This chart nicely lays out the reasons for that. So kudos to whoever did that one. Okay, we're now at number eight on the top list of 2021. Uh, here we have who would be emperor of China today. And I actually showed this chart in the video that we did on the emperors of China because it was so useful and so perfect as the ending for that video because it shows how... The Qing Dynasty can be traced all the way to the present. So, of course, the last emperor was Pu Yi, but Pu Yi had a brother who has some living descendants today, but he also had a cousin who lived to the year 2015, and that particular person was thought of as the heir to the line, and so then that person's son is the current heir today. And I think Jack mentioned in that video uh, that he is some kind of civil servant. So, you know, it's it's just really interesting to think that here's a person who, um, you know, would have been emperor perhaps. And, you know, now he's doing some sort of desk job. I also want to mention that the person who made this chart has made a lot of really good charts. In fact, uh, I featured another one of his charts. He did the Afghanistan monarchs. And so we did a whole video using his chart. So I really appreciate his work. He seems to be able to nail the useful charts style perfectly. So he's, he's done who would be emperor of Korea as well and lots of interesting stuff. So thanks to him. Okay, here we have the history of the Holy Roman Empire. And yet again, this is a huge chart. I think we featured this one last time. Uh, this uh, might have been in the previous video. But this is just amazing because it not only traces the Holy Roman Emperors, but I believe all the electors and uh, various dukes as well. 
So this is neat because not only do you have the family tree, but over on the far right, you've got some maps, some explanation, you've got a timeline of the emperors, and you've even in the bottom right corner, you have um, the flags of the various German states today. Um, so you can kind of correlate that back to some of the previous duchies uh, and so forth. So amazing amount of work that went into this. So super cool. All right, so the last chart, this one came in at number 10, going by upvotes. And I'm glad this one made the top 10, because one of the things that has been requested quite a lot for me to do on the channel is something to do with languages and how they fit together in a tree. This one is the evolution of the languages of Europe. So this is not all the languages in the world, but all the languages from Europe. So not just Indo-European languages, but you can see from the key here, it also has Uralic languages and some other smaller families as well. So just for as an example, let's let's find English on the chart and let's trace it back up. So here we can see English came from Middle English. From Middle English, we also get the Scots language today. But Middle English came from Anglo-Saxon, which came from Anglo-Frisian. And then Anglo-Frisian from Proto-North Sea Germanic, which came from Proto-West Germanic. So, of course, from Proto-West Germanic, you also get Dutch and German, of course. And then if you keep going back, you can add in some of the other Germanic languages. They all come back to Proto-Germanic. And then Proto-Germanic, I think, goes all the way back up to the top as a descendant of Proto-Indo-European. But of course, there are so many other branches of Proto-Indo-European that lead to languages like French and Italian and so forth. So this chart lays it all out very nicely and shows how they are all related. Okay, so that was the top 10 posts on the subreddit in order of the amount of upvotes they received from 1 to 10. So now I'm going to show you another 10 that I chose that I personally liked for one reason or another. And these ones I'm not going to show in any order, um, just in a random order. So these are not ranked in any way. I'm just going to show you 10 more that really stood out to me. So this one here is who would be king of Argentina if Carlota Joaquina of Spain had been queen? And this is something that I did not know about. At first glance, I thought this chart was maybe talking about Portugal or Brazil. But I guess at some point, Argentina, which uh, I forget the previous name for Argentina, but it was one of the uh, former regencies of Spain. There was actually a movement to have this particular queen uh, made queen. And so if that had happened, of course, we, we don't know what exactly would have happened, but the line could have gone in various different ways because she had lots of different children. So depending on uh, what method of succession they chose or maybe which descendants were reigning in other places like Portugal or Brazil, history could have gone in a lot of different directions. And this chart nicely lays out the possibilities, which I found very interesting. Of course, uh, some of the more popular videos on the Useful Charts channel are the Who Would Be King videos. And I've got a lot of requests for all kinds of different countries, uh, and I haven't been able to do them all. So it's nice that on the subreddit, some people have taken up the task and have done uh, kind of these Who Would Be King charts. There are several other similar ones on the subreddit you can check out. Some fan-made charts of Who Would Be King for some other countries as well. Okay, this one I really liked. This is who would be king of the United States today if the Prussian scheme had worked out. The Prussian scheme was actually, this is true, this is real. Um, during the American Revolution, someone suggested that America become a monarchy and the monarch should be one of Frederick the Great's younger brothers. Uh, his name was Henry, and he was actually suggested to become the monarch of the United States. Now, of course, that didn't happen. But what would have happened if that did go forward? Uh, and it, it becomes quite interesting. So it, it's a difficult question to answer because, first of all, Henry died childless, so we can't trace his descendants down to today. So we have to make some assumptions. So the assumption would be then that the line would pass through another brother, obviously not through Frederick the Great. Well, Frederick the Great didn't have any children either, so the line actually passed through Augustus William, and then Frederick William II, who would have been the nephew of Frederick the Great, he's the one who became the next king of Prussia. 
So let's assume that when Henry died, it would pass to someone in the Prussian line, but it wouldn't go to kind of like the first in line because the first in line would be king in or of Prussia. So the next kind of like second in line person would have been William here on the chart. And in fact, I think I looked at this and I think there might have been another older brother in between Frederick William III and William, but he didn't have any children. So eventually it would have gone to William. So then if, you know, there's a lot of assumptions here, but let's say that this kind of next best candidate, you know, putting aside the direct line of Prussian kings, because we can imagine that Prussia and the United States wouldn't have wanted to share a monarch. I think it's pretty safe to say that it, it would have fell on William's line here. You can see that it would have gone to his son, Albert, and then his daughter, Elizabeth. Again, this is assuming that in the United States, they would have used male preference primogeniture instead of a strict male-only line. So then we would have had a house change. It would have changed to the House of Hesse and would have stayed there all the way down to 1939. But then this line dies out completely. So then it would have had to go back and go through a female line, which then actually very interestingly, leads to the house of Mountbatten, which is the house of Prince Philip, the recently deceased husband of Queen Elizabeth II. So it wouldn't actually have gone to him, but it would have gone to uh, his uncle, I believe it was, um, Louis Mountbatten, and then Louis's daughter and that daughter's son, Philip. So had the Prussian scheme worked out, we actually might have ended up with a king of America who technically belonged to the same house as the next king of the United Kingdom, Prince Charles. So that's just a fun bit of alternative history. So here's something a bit different. This is a family tree of the nine worthies. Now, the nine worthies were nine kings or military leaders that during the medieval period were really looked up to. So three came from Greco-Roman descent, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, and Hector, Prince of Troy. Uh, three were Jewish. So you have King David, Joshua, who was the successor to Moses, and then Judah Maccabee, the leader of the Maccabees. And then you get three Western European leaders, Charlemagne, King Arthur, and Godfrey, the first king of Jerusalem. So this particular chart shows how all nine of these individuals are related. Now, obviously, the first thing I have to point out is that a lot of this chart is legendary, if not mythological. Some of the people on here, such as Joshua or Hector or King Arthur, are straight up legendary characters that we don't even know for sure if they existed in real life because we have no historical records for them. Whereas others, such as Charlemagne or Alexander the Great or Judah Maccabee, we do know that they were historical. So this chart definitely mixes history with legend. So for example, the link between King Arthur and the Roman line here that also leads to Julius Caesar, I mean, that is highly, highly speculative, if not completely fictional. Even the link between Charlemagne, who was historical, and Cleopatra there, you can see, um, th again, very speculative, probably not accurate at all. But for the sake of fun, this is indeed a really cool chart from kind of a just legendary point of view. So thank you to whoever made that one. Okay, the next one I want to show you is a tree of the Arskid dynasty uh, in Persia. And then this person has actually also done one of the Sassanids. But I wanted to show this one because I just, I really like the style. A lot of people have mirrored the useful chart style very well, whereas other people have kind of developed their own styles. And this chart is a good example of that. I like how the coins are used and they're kind of like bigger than the boxes. So they kind of just stand out kind of nicely on the chart. Plus, I wanted to point out that, you know, there's there's a lot of dynasties that I don't cover on the channel because, you know, some some topics don't do as well as other topics. But I really appreciate that fans are able to maybe delve into other countries, other civilizations, kingdoms, whatnot, that maybe aren't as well known or as popular and don't get covered um, but the creators of these charts do cover them. And so that's great. So if you're looking for some more like obscure charts of some stuff that's not covered on the channel, definitely check out the Reddit and you'll find lots of cool examples from all the different regions of the world. 
Okay, this one here is super cool. I really like this one because at first glance, I was like, hey, wait, that's my chart. But if you look closely, obviously it's in Hebrew, not in English. So this person said that he made this, I think, for his parents or relatives who couldn't speak English and he wanted to show the chart to them. So he recreated the entire thing and he did an amazing job. And the entire thing is reversed, which is kind of cool because Hebrew is written from right to left. So the creator of this chart didn't actually have to mirror the whole thing, but it's kind of a cool nod to how Hebrew is reversed. And he pointed out that at the top, you can find my name, Matt Baker, in Hebrew, which I was able to find. I don't speak Hebrew, but I can I can read it. Um, I know biblical Hebrew and prayer Hebrew fairly well. So if you're curious to see how my name is spelt in Hebrew, there it is. Next up is a chart of the various monarchs or sultans of Malaysia. And this is, first of all, a really well-made chart. I really like the style and also very useful. I thought about covering Malaysia on the channel, but to date have yet to do it. Malaysia is really interesting because Malaysia actually has nine monarchs, all sultans that are in charge of various sultanates that make up Malaysia. And what they do is they have a rotational cycle where I believe it's every four years. I might be wrong on that, but every four or five years, they switch who is the head monarch of the entire country. So currently it is this guy here. And I was curious as to whether there was any intermarriage between these various houses, various sultanates. And according to this chart, there does seem to be at least some. Okay, I found this particular chart really interesting because it covers Native American history. And I've really struggled to come up with topics for Native American genealogy because a lot of times information was passed orally only, so we don't have a lot of records. I did do a video on uh, Vice President Charles Curtis, and we talked about some Native American history there. But this one focuses on the Sioux Nation and kind of centers on a famous individual known as Sitting Bull. And I didn't realize that he actually has quite a few relatives that are known and that he links into some other names that are known from U.S. history. So this is actually a chart that I would like to look at in more detail at some point and maybe dig into the research behind this and uh, learn more about some of these connections. Because, you know, I, I do like to cover from time to time on the channel uh, topics that are not as well covered as they should be in the mainstream. And Native American history is definitely one of those areas that doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Okay, so here we have a chart of a particular peerage from the Ming Dynasty. And the person who made this chart has made a lot of charts on the subreddit, so I wanted to feature one of his. And again, he's kind of developed his own unique style, which I really like and which I find very nice to look at. So again, here we have kind of uh, some lineages that aren't as well known to people in the West, but I like to see that they are being covered by fans of the channel. So again, on the subreddit, you'll find lots of charts from lesser known places, or at least lesser covered places, such as even Africa or the Pacific and so forth. Okay, here's a fairly simple chart, but I wanted to feature a chart by this particular chart creator because they have done a lot of different charts, mostly of famous individuals, whether they be uh, authors or politicians or whatnot. This one is about Virginia Woolf, a very important author, and so I really appreciated uh, her getting some attention. And you can see how this chart shows that she has not only Scottish ancestry, but also some English and French. So like I said, this particular creator has made a lot of charts, so I just really appreciate the work that that person has done. Last but not least is this chart here. And looking at the style, particularly that background map, this just seems really familiar. And yeah, that is, of course, because this one was submitted by the Useful Charts animator, Siawish Raymond, host of the channel Al Mukadama. And he's made this really nice chart of the royal dynasties of Al Andalus. And he has done it in a very unique style rather than just copy my own, which I might add he is actually really good at doing as well. I do hope it is okay to mention that 
I have been talking to him about making some Islamic family tree charts and even some Islamic timeline charts that hopefully we'll turn into posters and make available at Useful Charts. So that's something that you can look forward to in the future. Okay, so that was just a look at some of the charts that have appeared on the Useful Charts subreddit during 2021. There's a lot more there though, so I encourage you to go over to the subreddit and take a look and you'll be able to find a lot more cool charts. And especially, I want to say a big thank you to all of the fans who have put time and energy and research into creating these charts. I can't say how much I've enjoyed seeing them, looking at them, and in some cases, even using them for research to create my own charts. So I hope as we go forward into 2022 that the subreddit will continue to grow and evolve and that we continue to get lots more fan-made charts. And I think we're going to have to make this into an annual tradition. So maybe at the end of next year, we will do a third video where I react to some of the fan-made charts out there. So if you want to see the previous video that I made showing fan-made charts, I'll put a link to that in the description. And if you want to go over to this subreddit, I've put a link to that there as well. So finally, I want to say I hope you had a good 2021. And here's hoping that there are many good things ahead for all of us in 2022. Happy New Year and thanks for watching. <laughs>